All right. I'm currently making content. I'm making a video, and I'm making a video for YouTube, baby. If you're in the YouTube audience, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and the bell, and comment below. Helps me out very much in the uh, in the algorithm. We're talking today about May Day. Today is May 1st. Uh, it is May Day, uh, and this is separate uh, from the historical May Day. Uh, 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 guys. Welcome in, Ali Osher. <laughs> Everyone follow Ali Osher. Uh, this is tr separate from the traditional May Day uh, celebrating the, the changing of seasons. Okay, just to make that clear, this is International Workers Day, May Day. That, that May Day, exactly. Okay, so we're going to talk about what May Day is, where it came from, uh, some important people along the way, some important events, and uh, we're going to try to make sense of what May Day is, how it's different from Labor Day in the United States, and uh, here we go. May Day. We're going to start with the Jacobin article uh, written by Rosa Luxemburg. One of their, uh, looks like Rosa Luxemburg wrote an article for Jacobin. I hope, I hope, I hope they, uh, they, they paid Rosa. Wait, hold on. This is weird. <clears throat> this is, okay, so clearly this, is, this was written a long time ago. Rosa Luxemburg on the roots of May Day. I will be reading this out loud. The happy idea of using a proletarian holiday celebration as a means to attain the eight-hour day was first born in Australia. The workers there decided in 1856 to organize a day of complete stoppage together with meetings and entertainment as a demonstration in favor of the eight-hour day. You know, they were working a lot more before. The day of the celebration was to be April 21st. At first, the Australian workers intended this only for the year 1856. But this first celebration had a, such a strong effect on the proletarian masses of Australia, enlivening them and leading the, uh, to new agitation, that it was decided to repeat the celebration every year. In fact, what could give the workers greater courage and faith in their own strength than a mass work stoppage, which they had decided themselves? What could give more courage to the eternal slaves of the factories and the workshops than the mustering of their own troops? Thus, the idea of a proletarian celebration was quickly accepted and, from Australia, began to spread to other countries until finally it had conquered the whole proletarian world. The first to follow the example of the Australian workers were the Americans in 1886, decided May 1st should be the day of universal work stoppage. On this day, 200,000 of them left their work and demanded the eight-hour day. Later, police and legal harassment prevented the workers for many years from repeating this size of demonstration. However, in 1888, they renewed their decision and decided that the next celebration would be May 1st, 1890. In the meanwhile, workers' movement in Europe had grown strong and animated. The most powerful expression of this movement occurred at the International Workers' Congress in 1889. At this Congress, attended by 400 delegates, it was decided that the eight-hour day must be the first demand, whereupon the delegate of the French unions, the worker Levine from Bordeaux, uh, moved that this demand be expressed in all countries through a universal work stoppage. The delegate of the Union of the American Workers called attention to the decision of his comrades to strike on May 1st, 1890, and the Congress decided on this date for the universal proletarian celebration. And a good May Day to you. In this case, as 30 years before in Australia, the workers really thought only of a one-time demonstration. The Congress decided that the workers of all lands would demonstrate together for the eight-hour day on May 1st, 1890. No one spoke of a repetition of the holiday for the next years. Naturally, no one could predict the lightning way in which this idea would succeed and how quickly it would be adopted by the working classes However, it was enough to celebrate the May Day simply one time in order that everyone understand and feel that May Day must be a yearly and continuing institution. The 1st of May demanded the introduction of the eight-hour day, but even after this goal was uh, reached, May Day was not given up. As long as the struggle of the workers against the bourgeoisie and the ruling class continues, as long as all demands are not met, May Day, May Day, will be the yearly expression of these demands. And when better days dawn, when the working class of the world has won its deliverance, then, too, humanity will probably celebrate May Day in honor of the bitter struggles and the many sufferings of the past. 
Rosa Luxemburg, a Polish Jewish uh, Marxist theorist and revolutionary leader, murdered by far right paramilitaries in 1919. Here's Azure Scapegoat to tell us more. If you've been on the socialist side of the internet recently, you've no doubt seen the Bernie Sanders killed Rosa Luxemburg meme floating around. But what does it mean? Who was Rosa Luxemburg and how did Bernie Sanders kill her? Rosa Luxemburg was born into a middle-class Jewish family in Poland on the 5th of March 1871 and grew up to become a famous Marxist economist and philosopher. She is also well known for criticizing not only the Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin but also the moderate socialists in the Social Democratic branch of Germany who at the time were actually anti-capitalistic which social democracy as an ideology is not today. This put Luxembourg in an interesting position between the Marxist-Leninists and the Social Democrats. One might imagine that this would lead to her becoming universally hated by the left. But Rosa Luxemburg is actually almost universally loved by the left, from orthodox Marxists to Maoists to even some anarchists. Plenty of these people criticize some of her ideas and don't agree with everything she said, but appreciate her contributions to socialist theory nonetheless. Rosa Luxemburg criticized the one-party state of the, what she believed was a bureaucratic and undemocratic Soviet Union. In her book, The Russian Revolution, Rosa Luxemburg wrote, freedom only for the members of the government, only for the members of the party, though they are quite numerous, is no freedom at all. Freedom is always the freedom of dissenters. The essence of political freedom depends not on the fanatics of justice, but rather on all the invigorating, beneficial and detergent effects of dissenters. If freedom becomes privileged, the workings of political freedom are broken. Vladimir Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg both wrote texts about the other, and they exchanged many letters. Despite their disagreements, a friendship was growing between them. And when Luxemburg died, Lenin wrote in 1919, but in spite of her mistakes, she was, and remains for us, an eagle. And not only will communists all over the world cherish her memory, but her biography and her complete works will serve as useful manuals for training many generations of communists all over the world. Since the 4th of August 1914, German social democracy has been a stinking corpse. This statement will make Rosa Luxemburg's name famous in the history of the international working class movement. And German social democracy is exactly what caused her death. One day, after Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were released from prison, where they had ended up for spreading anti-war propaganda, they declared a free socialist republic in Berlin. They founded the newspaper Der Rote Fahne, and around it created the Communist Party of Germany. On New Year's Day 1919, Rosa Luxemburg declared, Today we can seriously set about destroying capitalism once and for all. Nay, more, not merely are we today in a position to perform this task, nor merely is its performance a duty toward the proletariat, but our solution offers the only means of saving human society from destruction. In response to this, the social democratic... It's socialism or barbarism. ...democratic government of Germany sent in the right-wing extremist mercenary Freikorps to kill everyone involved in the uprising. Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were questioned whilst being tortured before they were shot in the head. Rosa Luxemburg's body was thrown into the Landwehr Canal. This incident has been called proof of the concept of social fascism. The idea that social democrats are for the workers when it's convenient for them. But when put under pressure, they quickly succumb to fascism and fascist ideas. So, since social democrats were responsible for the death of Rosa Luxemburg, and Bernie Sanders is a prominent social democrat who many on the left, especially those new to left-wing politics, admire, the Bernie Sanders killed Rosa Luxemburg meme is sort of a reminder that, while social democracy may sound like a nice alternative to actual socialism, its record isn't exactly spotless. If you like this video, then feel okay. free to like it and share it and all the other kinds of things if you want to. I did a couple extra things there, and you catch my Bernie sign behind me, which is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, no, I I understand that uh, electoralism blows. I get it. I get it. Rosa Luxemburg. Then here's Telesur with a piece. Yes, I'll read these out loud. Turn the music down. Before a revolution happens, it's perceived as impossible. 
After it happens, it's seen as having been inevitable. Marxist anti-war activist, revolutionary during World War I, famously advocated a general strike to radicalize workers, create an international socialist revolution. Vehemently opposed to Germany's involvement in the war. She believed it was a conflict of imperialism uh, that would only harm the German population civilians, right? She died. She was murdered, right? They tortured and murdered her. But her message will never be forgotten. Ella Sewer. Why do I... Why do I like Tella Sewer? Well, because they do stuff like that. You'll never see Western media do anything like that. If you go to the Wikipedia page... It's not always the best resource, but sometimes it's a start in place. In 1889, May Day was chosen as, as the date for International Workers' Day by the Socialists and Communists of the Second International, as well as anarchists, labor activists, and leftists in general around the world to commemorate the Haymarket Affair in Chicago. The Haymarket Affair, that's literally, I was literally in this neighborhood yesterday. Uh, and uh, we drive right past the spot. It happens all the time. It's sort of wild. Uh, the Haymarket Affair in Chicago and the struggle for an eight-hour working day, International Workers' Day, like we said, is different from the celebration of the traditional May Day. Okay, but I, I don't think they're co-opting it or anything, I, I, but they did They did take the words May Day. That's why I guess I like to also say inter International Workers' Day. It's, it's more accurate, you know, it's more... Spells out what it is. All right. So. I wanted to go to the, do this piece on the Haymarket uh, uh, strike and um, the incident, the bombing, and then I think what happened afterwards, too. Chilling. By the 1880s, the United States was going through major political, social, and economic changes. Industry was growing in scale, and innovations in manufacturing were leading to the production of more goods and services. Factories needed workers, and more and more workers crowded in the cities, causing conflicts between businesses and workers within these industrial centers. One of these cities was Chicago, home to McCormick Harvester Works. For years, the McCormick family had been locked in a battle with the heavily Irish faction of the factory's workers who were in a union and would often strike over wage cuts. Despite efforts to break union activity at the plant, the McCormicks only succeeded in driving many of the factory's disaffected workers to join outside labor unions. On May 1st, 1886, Chicago unions were among those participating in a general strike to limit the work day to eight hours in an age where working 10 or more hours a day was commonplace. Two days later, violence erupted between union and non-union workers at the McCormick factory after union workers discovered those who crossed the picket line had been given the eight-hour workday. During the skirmish, the police intervened, leaving two workers... There's no war but class war. ...workers dead and others wounded. On May 4th, a mass meeting was scheduled in Chicago's Haymarket Square, a bustling commercial area, to protest the police brutality and the shootings that occurred outside the McCormick factory. Labor activists August Spees and Samuel Fielden, along with the political journalist Albert Parsons, were among those who gave speeches. At around 10.30 that evening, the police demanded that the meeting disperse. In the moments that followed, an unknown person threw a dynamite bomb into the crowd. Many were injured and a policeman was killed. The police retaliated. Shots were fired. Protesters were struck with clubs. By the time the crowd had dispersed minutes later, 73 policemen had been wounded. Six of them died from injuries. Four civilians were killed, and at least 12 others were wounded. Although the meeting had been peaceful until the explosion, the public blamed the riot on the organized labor movement and on anarchists and socialists. Because both of these groups were largely made up of immigrants, it added to a fear that foreign ideas threatened American values. 
After an intensive investigation, eight men were arrested, including Spees, Fielden, and Parsons, and tried for inciting the Haymarket riot. After a spectacular trial, where it was revealed that some of the men indicted did not even attend the meeting, and it could not be proven which, if any of the men, had built or set off the bomb, all eight were found guilty and convicted. Four were Damn. executed. In the wake of the Haymarket riots, the labor movement suffered serious setbacks. Membership rapidly dwindled across the country, and for years, anti-union sentiment swept the nation. This event would serve as an example of the powerful tensions between business and workers in the industrial age. Yeah, and then I guess bomb throwing anarchists. Produced by NBC. Produced by NBC. Wow, actually. Going now to the longer breakthrough news piece, U.S. union leaders murdered fighting for an eight-hour day, Origins of May Day. We're going to learn a little bit more about this. I'm wondering what Eugene and uh, Rania have to say. Really difficult. There's, like, so many obstacles. We're just having to, like, yeah. boop, boop, boop. Like, there's just, like, so many things coming at you at once between the algorithmic suppression, between the boosting of these right-wing narratives, between this ongoing battle between, like, these two factions of the ruling class, like the liberals and the conservatives, mm -hmm. uh, and then trying not to get purged from social media in the yeah. meantime. But we want to turn to another important story. Uh, Story about a holiday, if you will, that's upcoming here. That's May Day. It's May 1st, International Workers' Day. Very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Dr. Tony Gilpin, who's a labor historian, writer, and activist, whose most recent book, which I have to say I could not recommend more highly, is The Long Deep Grudge. Dr. Gilpin, thank you so much for being with us here on the Freedom Side. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously, upcoming this weekend is, is May Day. For many people probably know, many people watching this show, that around the world, it's known as International Workers' Day, sort of the Labor Day, if you will, for most countries. Obviously, in the U.S., we have a Labor Day in September. Uh, so how is it, uh, Dr. Gilpin, that we're in such a situation where the U.S. has a different, quote-unquote, Labor Day or holiday for workers that seems to be different than almost the entire rest of the world? Right. Um, it's an ironic story, a complicated story, but um, the ironic part is that um, much of the world recognizes um, International Labor Day and its origins in the United States and specifically in Chicago, that uh, it goes all the way back to 1886 when there was a massive uprising of workers across the country um, centered in Chicago. I happen to be from Chicago, so I'm going to mention Chicago, Woo! Chicago a lot here because <laughs> uh, when we're talking about May Day, we have to talk about um, the great city of Chicago. And uh this world class uh, city. massive Best uprising food in, the world. in 1886 of workers across the country who went on strike, um, had organized and went on strike on May 1st, uh, which was a sunny Saturday in Chicago um, for the eight hour day. Because, of course, in the 19th century at that time, workers routinely worked 60 hour weeks, 10 hour days, six days a week. Conditions were horrendous. Living conditions were um, even worse for them. Uh, they could be hired and fired um, at will, of course. And you so this that. step towards um, some control over working conditions and their lives was a massive step forward. It was an incredibly successful initially event with um, about 300,000 workers participating across the country, 30,000 going out on strike on May Day in Chicago. Um, so... Um, and in response to this um, um, show of strength by workers, a lot of employers immediately did grant that eight hour day. Um, but that's not the end of the story. We wish it were. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason that May Day became internationally recognized is not for the triumph, it's for the tragedy that took place a few days later. Um, there was, um, as part of this strike, there had been a, um, a rally in front of the massive McCormick um, Works factory. It was a farm equipment factory. Uh, there was a, 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 a struggle with police. The police fired on the crowd, killed um, several workers. And in response to that, there was a rally on May 4th at Haymarket Square, which probably you're 
um, listeners know a little bit about the Haymarket, infamous Haymarket bombing that took place that evening after a peaceful rally and uh, a number of speakers. And in the ensuing, uh, the, the bomb exploded, some police officers were killed, many workers were also injured and killed in the melee. Um, but of course, the, um, the blame instantly the from, memorial. you know, you were just talking about multi-billionaires and their control of the media, so that's not a new story. And uh, in the ensuing crackdown on labor organizers and especially on the thriving anarchist movement, um, eight uh, worker leaders were arrested, four of them eventually hung. And so those Haymarket martyrs became internationally recognized for the struggle for the eight hour day, for the struggle to improve working conditions. And May Day, which had been a sort of amorphous workers holiday, became recognized across the globe as um, uh, a workers celebration, a commemoration of that initial struggle to improve the lives of workers. But in our country, because it became associated with radicalism, um, there, the forces, the powers that be moved away from celebrating May Day towards our, the Labor Day that we now celebrate in September. There it is. So in uh, the mid 20s and the first Red Scare and then in, 19, in the 1950s, you know, we elevated Labor Day and what we now what we now officially call May 1st is it now is. Loyalty Day in the United States. Loyalty Day? What? I did not know that. That is so sus, dude. That is so sus, man. Holy smokes. That is cringe as shit, dude. Um, so they did two things. By, like, killing off May Day. Three things, I guess. They... Separated the labor movements from the labor movement here in the United States from international solidarity with workers. They, I don't know what my second thing was, but the third thing is they added this loyalty day, this like extra thing. And then like, you know, some people are going to see through that, but some libs are going to lap that up. Um, wild. Wild. Everywhere else, workers get the day off and have parades and celebrate um, that, you know, celebrate the notion that workers. Uh, the second thing was it separated it from the more radical elements. Um, are uh, the ones who create all wealth. Here in, in the United States, we celebrate loyalty. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but that's not, but people have seized this holiday back. But she's and, a Marxist. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. immigrants' rights groups have, you know, have certainly um, Fuck taken loyalty back May Day and made it a workers' holiday again. So that's the quick story. I can fill in any more details if you a, if you'd like that. But they apparently have a parade in New Lenox. Loyalty Day, Cub Scouts. They they do a march on Loyalty Day. I bet I bet a lot of your listeners are quite um, familiar with that with that story. Well, so how did September end up being our Labor Day? Like, it, was that picked for any particular reason, or like, or was it just like a random? As long as it's not May first and connected to like Loyalty Day, it's insane. A day set aside for the reaffirmation of loyalty to the United States and for the recognition of the heritage of American freedom. That's right. It was conceived in the height of the second Red Scare. What exactly was this? Okay, after World War II. That's when anti-communism was super, was the word virulent? My lord. Like the international version. Yeah, it's actually kind of complicated. Wow, the man. push to actually make that September holiday um, Labor Day actually predates even the um, the May Day and the Hay the Haymarket um, incident and um, May Day emerging as this international holiday. Um, so it's kind of this. Yes, and a happy boot looking day to you, Nace. Long and connected. Um, uh, 
uh, push to, to, to recognize a particular day as Labor Day in the United States. So there had already been this kind of September um, date on the books. It's only after, and, and, and the uh, American Federation of Labor in existence then was pushing, not, not, not again, before Haymarket. So, um, so it just updated the title of the stream. Happy bootlicking day to you. At lo loyalty day, loyalty day, LMAO didn't have the political overtones initially. It was just September was a good day to have Labor Day. It's after um, the Haymarket riot and the crackdown on worker radicalism that May Day becomes associated with a particular radical um, view of the labor movement. And so it's after that and into the, into the 20th century that a more conservative labor movement begins to embrace the notion of Labor Day in September. And that's when you also in the 1920s with the Red Scare get this, we're not gonna, we're gonna disassociate from all this stuff going on internationally. And we're going to create this thing called Loyalty Day on May 1st. So, um, so it is kind of a complicated history, but the bottom line is that, you know, that across the globe in places like Mexico and France and, um, you know, that, that May Day and the Haymarket martyrs are um, synonymous with a struggle for workers' rights. And here in the United States, it's only, uh, it's not an official holiday. It's not um, celebrated by um, labor unions per se. It's um, May Day is for the people. I like that. And, and also they've made Labor Day and, and, they leaned into the Labor Day, right? And celebrate, we do it in September. Uh, and it's just, it just, just celebrates labor generic, just, just in a, in a very broad way, right? As opposed to like worker solidarity, you know, International Workers Day. Do you see how those two things are way different? One is celebrating just work and one is celebrating workers. Um, and it honestly makes me think of the Nazis' Arbeit macht frei slogan, which means work will make you free. So, of course, the United States goes a little bit closer to the Nazi view of things. Every fucking time. And it says on the, on the scroll down there. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And... You know, one thing about, I mean, it seems just so uh, time, maybe it's timely every year, but it seems so timely to be kind of excavating this radical labor history now, as you know, last year we saw Striketober, now we're seeing Amazon Labor Union, we're seeing Starbucks Workers United, and it does feel that, I, I mean, there's such a, a just unbelievable suppression of this radical current of labor history that obviously was very significant in the history of the country, but has been suppressed like May Day for political reasons. But it does feel like so much of the, the energy, the history, the lineage of those times when you read those stories that maybe we're in something of a similar moment as some of these previous upsurges. I wonder what you think about that. Right, absolutely. I mean, this is a very exciting time in terms of what's going on with labor organizing, with the, with the new kinds of organizing as we've seen it at um, at Amazon. It isn't, you know, we're breaking away from the traditional labor movement and the uh, um, to to embrace, you know, I would say new tactics. Except actually, many of these tactics are really old. And you know, so so part of what I have talked about when I've talked about um, the Haymarket legacy and why I think um, uh, activists today might want to look not just to the struggles for, of the 1930s, but all the way back to the 19th century, because, you know, the tendency has been sometimes even in the labor movement, um, when talking about Haymarket and the hanging of those um, of those activists, to call them labor organizers, to disassociate them from the radicalism that they embraced. They were anarchists. There was a thriving anarchist socialist movement in Chicago. Um, they were at the center of labor organizing these anarchists and it does them a disservice, it does their memory a disservice to not emphasize that radicalism that they embraced. They were anti, fierce anti-capitalists. Um, they were not simply um, pure and simple trade unionists who were interested only in improving conditions. They were interested in building a new society that would that would be controlled and run by and for workers. Um, so today's activists, I think, are also struggling not just to come up with ways to improve 
working conditions and wages for workers, but to think about how to reorganize society in ways that are fairer, more just, more equal, um, to address the kind of rampant inequality that um, has so broken this country. And so, you know, I encourage them to look back to, you know, to pick up this great book by James Green about um, Haymarket, death in the Haymarket, trying to get it the right place. <laughs> um, you know, or just because, because again, look towards these movements in the past that were interested in ways that workers could really take control, um, not just of their workplaces, but of the entire um, country. And, and certainly that anarchist movement centered in Chicago was one of those um, really important times. Um, and um, so I think that's, that's what we need to remember as it wasn't just a struggle for better conditions, it was a struggle for a better workers world. And it's so important to recognize all of this because, of course, you know, I'm thinking of when I was, you know, going to school, elementary school, high school. Uh, I think there's like a few things that stood out. You know, you'd kind of hear about the Haymarket massacre. You would, of course, we learned about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, like when I'm thinking of moments in, in kind of like labor history that you do learn in school. But the rest of it is just kind of all of the labor history of America is sort of like a race. Whitewashed. It's, including the fact that you, what you're talking about is basically all of these radical leftists who were involved in labor organizing. You had communist and socialist organizations and anarchists. And I know as we have a very short amount of time here, but I'm just curious, like, I, can you explain very briefly, like, what, what happened to the radical left in the labor movement? Because there was this, like, internal struggle throughout the Red Scare, and many of those people were purged. Um, right. Well, um, I can recommend my book that way, The Long Beach <laughs> yes. Grudge, because that is my exactly point. what that's about. You know, what happened to, we had, I've talked, you know, the Haymarket um, story is a story of the 19th century, though it carries through into the 20th century and the Farm Equipment Workers Union, the left wing union at the center of my book, um, you know, believe that it it because it also was involved in organizing those very same factories um, that it carried that legacy forward. So um, so the drive to um, to expel and, and quell left-wing radicalism within the labor movement has been an ongoing one that has changed. I mean, you know, and then again, at the center of, you know, I mean, one of the, the one of a good metaphor for this is that when we, when, you know, when the Haymarket martyrs have been talked about, even by labor unions in the past, their radicalism has been downplayed. And, and so, you know, I think again, young activists today who are embracing new forms of politics, socialism, anarchism, you know, need to recognize that this is an American tradition. You know, this radicalism is an American tradition. We don't have a labor movement that has simply been interested in wage and our gains, but in um, building a new kind of world and building workers control in the workplace and outside the workplace. So, um, so history is full of those examples. There are great labor histories that, um, that, it, that, tell those stories. And um, so just, you know, when you're, when you're, if you're out there organizing at Amazon or Starbucks and you're getting a little low on steam, you know, go find some of those earlier, those, those stories of those earlier struggles, because they can really be inspiring and not, you know, and, and the Haymarket story is kind of a, you know, a, a story of triumph and tragedy, but it's also a story that didn't end in 1886. It carried through into the 20th century. And I really do think it, you know, it, it touches on the struggles that are going on today. No, I, I, I think so for absolute certain. I mean, and certainly one element of your book that I think is also extraordinarily relevant is the, the role of the labor movement in the struggle against racism. And, and, you know, it's hard for me to, I don't want to reveal too much about the book for those who haven't read it. You should go read it. But, you know, the history of the farm equipment workers organizing the South, the importance of racism, which to me is so evocative of what we've seen with the organizing around Amazon and Nissan in the deep South today. Right. Those, though, and again, in history, those organizers who took on racism, who recognized that the only way for workers to advance is through genuine collective struggle and true solidarity, those were radical organizers. You know, and in the 19th century, we're talking about trying to unite immigrant groups 
with Native Ameri with, with, with those who were called Native Americans at the time, with white workers. Um, and, you know, in, in the Haymarket anarchists were German immigrants. So, um, you know, so we have a labor movement that haltingly and imperfectly has struggled towards a solidarity that will embrace all workers. And right, it was it were the, the, the communist organizers who were at the center of the farm equipment workers and so many of the other CIO unions in the 1930s also knew that combating racism head on was central to building a labor movement that would really be able to, to take on the titans of capital. Um, but they were, they were genuine radicals. So again, I think, um, you know, that anti-racist um, and um, uh, uh, trend is, you know, you need to look back at who was actually leading those fights. And you'll find, again, those, those folks who were embracing a different kind of vision for American labor and for, um, and for the country itself. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Gilpin, we really appreciate you being willing to join us here on the show. I'll, I'll say it again. I definitely can recommend your book, The Long Deep Grudge, quite a bit. And we really appreciate you giving us some of your valuable time here on the Freedom Side. Well, thank you very much. And everybody on, on Sunday, have a, have a lift a glass to the Haymarket right. anarchists. Mm -hmm. uh, all, I think, really well said. Maybe she's uh, anarchist, and that's good, too. I, I, I really enjoy that video. I liked um, her, her presentation. And... Uh, Big shout out to the crew over at Breakthrough News, Rania and Eugene Perrier, Rania Kalik. Uh, Excuse me. Okay, well, that built on some of the knowledge that we built uh, earlier in this clip, and I think that's probably a good place to end this off. Um, the origins of May Day, how it's different from Labor Day, um, why Labor Day was sort of chosen by elites here in the United States instead of in uh, a more uh, explicitly uh, international, international uh, solidarity, internationally solidaristic uh, 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 celebration. That's why they did that. They they didn't want it to be like that, and they in fact wanted it to just celebrate the general idea of labor instead of workers. And that's why uh, uh, we should celebrate, uh, you know, International Workers' Day instead of Loyalty Day, on May 1st, on May Day. And, uh, yeah, thank you for watching this clip. If you made it to the end of the YouTube clip, thank you. Hit the like button. Again, hit that like button. Comment below. What did you think about the whole thing? What did you learn? Um, but, 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 yeah. Otherwise, if you're watching the YouTube clip, make sure you join us right here on Twitch.tv. You can hang out with me in the chat and all these other really cool people. Um... And uh, we learn together, and it's really great. It's good. Everyone says it's the best time they've ever had. You can support on Patreon as well for $3 a month, and you'll get early access to all of my interviews with uh, with always-based and never-cringe guests uh, on Leftist and Chill, my interview show. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for, for watching. Stick around live live chat. We're going to just thank the patrons. Thank you, patrons. Blake, Jasmine, Boondocks, Dragon, Ira, Vivian, Nasai, Sleeve, Anson, Daryl, Anantoli, Ray, Glen Allen, Mario, Raul, Kevin, Tony, Bobson, Willie, Jeremy, Scott, Joan, Dean, Mike, Dwight, Tim, Carl, Mike, and Todd Gonzalez. Thank you, Todd.